Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, we like to start on time, and Marvin will make sure we end on time. Won't you, Marvin? Yeah. <laughs> please, uh, please take your seats. Uh, I'm Wendy Chamberlain, and I'd like to uh, warmly welcome you to the Middle East Institute again. I see many familiar faces. Um, those of you who who uh, have been here before and know us know that this is our temporary headquarters. We're actually rebuilding our our building our, right in back of us uh, on N Street. If you wanted to take a peek, uh, I think you'd be shocked at how fast the progress is uh, is being completed. They already have the fifth floor framed out. This time next year, uh, we'll be meeting again, talking about how the conflict in Afghanistan has ended. Uh, but we will be doing it in our new building, so welcome. Uh, the panel today is another extremely interesting one. It's talking about uh, a subject that is all very important to all of us. And, you know, we like to think, we, oftentimes people say that the conflict in Afghanistan has been raging for 17 years. And as I sat and started thinking about how I was going to introduce this panel today, uh, it's been much longer than 17 years. I think you could really go back to 1979. Uh, with the uh, Soviet invasion, and it has been pretty constant uh, conflict. U.S. re-engagement um, uh, in 2001, uh, it's been 17 years, but the conflict is much deeper and much longer. So the essential question that we all ask ourselves and that this panel will be addressing is, how is it going to end? Uh, and that's a serious question. It, it's certainly one of great urgency in this year alone, 2018. Just in 2018, there have been 2,200 civilian casualties. That's unacceptable. So here to discuss this issue, it's a terrific panel. Uh, it's led by our senior scholar and director of the Afghanistan-Pakistan uh, program here at the Middle East Institute, Dr. Marvin Weinbaum. He will introduce the rest of the panel, but let me just introduce Marvin, although it's crazy to introduce Marvin, all of you know him so well. He has been with the Middle East Institute uh, for over a decade. Before that, he was a, uh, a senior analyst at the State Department, and before that, he was a professor at uh, uh, University of Illinois Urbana campus. Um, I'd just like to remind you all to turn off your phones. We're, we're video, doing a video of this and a podcast, which we will put on our website. So if you missed a, missed a piece of it and want to go back and check, you'll be able to do that by just going to mei.edu. But we don't want to hear your telephone ring. So uh, mute it. Don't turn it off, because we would also encourage you to uh, tweet uh, the conversation today. And you can do that by tweeting hashtag MEI Afghanistan. So once again, I uh, want to welcome uh, the panelists and also to thank the MEI board member, Lou Hughes, who served in Afghanistan and has a great interest in the future of Afghanistan. And uh, he has supported uh, this lecture series. So Marvin, thank you. Yes, th thank you, Wendy. Uh and thank you for joining us this afternoon uh, and braving the rain, at least as it comes and goes. Uh, it's, it, I agree, this is an important panel, I think, for the reason that so much of our discussion here has been, in, in this town and in general, has been around how can we get to a political settlement, and I think with good reason here, because that's where we all would like to see this end as we look forward in Afghanistan. Well, this panel is premised on the conclusion that, and the reminder that there really are a number of outcomes, some of them favorable, some not, some more likely than others, but there are a num num number of end games here. And unless we're prepared to also to, to recognize this and indeed prepare ourselves for them, 
I think we will have done ourselves an injustice, particularly with respect to our international security policy. <clears throat> so what we're going to do now is we're going to begin with a brief, just a very brief discussion about is where are we now? What is, this, what is the, the starting point for this look forward, these pathways conceivably forward, which we'll, we'll deal with separately, some six of them. And to do this, let me just mention, as I'm starting from my right here, that uh, Javed Ahmed is here from, uh, Javed is a uh, non-resident scholar at the Atlantic, Atlantic Center. And uh, he is also a non-resident scholar at West Point. I'm making these very brief introductions because you have a little bit more on, your, on the flyer that you came in uh, and saw, and also on our website where we have a very full biography. Uh, Courtney is to my right here, Courtney Cooper. And Courtney is currently with the... Uh, <clears throat> Council, council on foreign, my, my eyes are, are, are deceived, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> with the Council on Current Foreign Relations and has been previously director of Afghanistan for the, in the National Security Council. And Seth Jones on my left here, Seth is, holds a chair position now in the International Threat Security, uh, Threats Project at CSIS. And uh, many of you knew him over the years at RAND. Uh, and he also is an adjunct professor uh, at uh, SAIS, at Johns Hopkins SAIS. So in no particular order here, who'd like to start us off? Where are we military and politically as a, as a starting point for this discussion? I can start. OK. Sure. So, um, First of all, uh, thank you, Marvin, and thank you, the Middle Institute, uh, for having me here, and I'm very glad to be here. Um, I do not think that we are um, in a state of perpetual uh, military stalemate in Afghanistan. I happen to believe that the Afghan conflict as in it is um, at an inflection point, both politically and militarily. Um, the conventional wisdom in Washington is, and in, in, it has been like this for a while now, is that there is no uh, military uh, solution uh, to ending the Afghan conflict. Um, that may be true, but by that logic, one can also argue that there's no plausible political solution to ending the Afghan conflict. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. Over the past few years, um, the Afghan conflict has um, entered a fundamentally different chapter. Um, the Afghan instability in the different internal and external uh, factors that contribute to uh, the Afghan instability has essentially taken the shape of a triangle. So on one corner of the triangle, you have uh, got the ideological insurgency. On the other corner, you have the undemocratic criminal patronage network. And on the, uh, and on the third corner of the triangle, you have uh, the uh, booming Afghan drug uh, enterprise. Um, now, all of these three sides are um, intertwined and they feed off one another. And as a result of this, uh, Afghanistan is fighting today multiple wars on multiple fronts. Uh, on the one hand, you have the Afghan government fighting a very brutal, externally enabled insurgency uh, that's led by a variety of actors, both state and non-state, that's no longer limited to the Taliban uh, alone. Um, and on the other hand, um, the country is fighting terrorism uh, that's facilitated by well over 20 or 21 uh, United Nations designated terrorist groups, and most of which is uh, directed arguably from uh, the governed spaces in Pakistan. Now, I agree that when two conflicting sides are trapped in a perpetual uh, uh, conflict where neither side can claim uh, outright military victory, then the two parties have to come uh, 
and negotiate and reach some sort of a negotiated political settlement. But unfortunately, there's a lack of a sincere negotiating partner on the, uh, on the part of the Taliban insurgency uh, to engage with the Afghan government and in good faith. Um, a clear example of that is the recent um, peace offer that was uh, um, offered by Afghan President Ghani uh, to the Taliban to come to the negotiating ta table without preconditions. In his peace proposal, uh, he offered the Taliban gen very generous peace terms, um, including offering to recognize them as a political group, uh, providing them with immunity or some sort of an immunity, political office, security arrangements, financial guarantees, um, and then bringing uh, and accommodating their, them and their uh, fighters from the Taliban, uh, as well as their families, um, and um, uh, accommodating them inside Afghanistan. Um, this comes in addition to removing their leaders from various blacklists. Uh, in response, the Taliban not only ignored that offer, but instead offer, uh, they, 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 they started to announce their uh, own um, spring offensive. So one reason behind Taliban's ignoring Ghani's offer may be that the insurgency is no longer the insurgency it used to be 22 years ago in 96. It's a, it's a fundamentally different insurgency uh, and has transformed fundamentally as well. So we are in effect dealing with a new Taliban uh, who are more lethal, who are more adaptive, and who are more effective. So before discussing any plausible alternative pathways or uh, scenarios that may potentially unfold in Afghanistan in the years ahead, I think we have to take this reality into account and critically analyze the internal dynamics of the Taliban uh, as well as the external dynamics of, of this new Taliban. Now, the new Taliban, and just a few brief points before I stop, um, uh, are quite uh, decentralized. Uh, they're uh, relatively incoherent, both horizontally and vertically. Um, they're splintered across different factions and offshoots. They, they're replete with, uh, with new recruits that are fresh out of Pakistani madrasas that are uh, eager to kill. Uh, driven by ego and fame. Um, they have little to no memory of the, of the Taliban regime of the 1990s, uh, nor do they have access to the Taliban leadership. Um, uh, most of the young uh, Taliban frontline commanders exercise a greater uh, autonomy in the field. Um, the Taliban, the new Taliban is also no longer a homogenous group as it once used to be. Uh, there are also multiple power centers, uh, centers within the Taliban, so that has fractured the movement's unity and cohesion, uh, to at least to an extent. Today, the group is increasingly take, taken over by the Haqqani network. The Haqqani network um, uh, control at least 15% of the Taliban's fighting force. Uh, they have also diversified their funding. Uh, the hard line, the, 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 the group itself is, is broadly split uh, between hardliners and the moderates. The hardliners are your numerical minority. The, the, the moderates are your numerical majority. The hardliners believe in military solution. The moderates wants to negotiate. But the hardliners have essentially uh, marginalized uh, the moderates. Now, what do the hardliners want? They want their Islamic Emirate back. Um, now, in, in these developments, we have seen significant regional realignments as well. Pakistan have become closer to Russia. Uh, Afghanistan have become more and more distant from, um, from uh, Pakistan as well. So, so as we look into exploring these alternative pathways, and I'll end with this, uh, we often forget that our solutions uh, to resolving the differences that exist between the multiple actors that are party to the Afghan conflict are often utopian in nature and also zero-sum. So, uh, so we have to recognize that challenge, and this is an important challenge. So how do you overcome that? And I'll stop here. Thank you, John. Sir. Yeah, uh, let me just jump in. Uh, you, you'll see, I think, some agreement, some disagreement in a few areas, but uh, let me just lay out three strands in response to your uh, comment, Mar uh, Marvin. And, and thanks, thanks, uh, Marvin, and thanks to Wendy for the opportunity to speak here on, on such a distinguished panel. Um, first comment is going to be on the military situation. Second is on the prospects for peace, set uh, peace settlement. And third, some broader societal uh, conditions on the ground. A little bit of the, if you remember the, the um, I think it's a Clint Eastwood movie, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Uh, my comments will be a little bit along those lines. Um, on, the, on the military situation, uh, when I read through the CIGAR reports, the Inspector General reports, or some of the DOD reports, um, there's a lot of security data out there. In terms of giving us a sense of how the situation is going in Afghanistan, um, 
there's a lot of data I think that's used that's not particularly helpful. Um, it's important to collect. Maybe it's input measures, for example, on num or output measures on number of forces trained. But I think there are a couple of things uh, that I'll highlight which give us, I think, a sense of how the military, the, the military situation is going. Um, and I would really characterize this currently, I don't think there's any way around this as, a, as, as at the very least a draw. Um, uh, and here's why I think that. One is, um, uh, it's an insurgency. There's a major incentive by both sides to control uh, populations. Not territory per se, because as anybody who spent much time in Afghanistan, there are desert regions, there are mountains, <laughs> but it's, population is the terrain of, a, of an insurgent and a government in an insurgency. The control of, of population data, um, you know, suggests that the Taliban is slightly increasing its control, not by a lot. Um, even the SIGAR data that just came out uh, on Taliban or broader insurgent control, about 9% in August of 2016, it's up to about 12%. So it's a slight increase, it's almost entirely in rural areas, although we have seen some um, fighting and uh, at least limited takeover of um, district and even in the case of Farah, uh, provincial areas, um, at least temporarily. Uh, Afghan government looks like it's slightly lost populated areas from 69% in August of 2016 to 65% today. So it's not a huge change. Um, and, and actually, if you look at the percentages, the Afghan government controls a much larger, or at least influences a much larger percentage of the population than the Taliban does right now. Um, so I think it, it, at best it's a draw. A uh, couple other things that I'd note, support data and take all of these public opinion polls with huge Caveats, I still don't see large popular support, particularly in urban areas, for the Taliban. Uh, we see it in, probably not surprisingly, in areas like Helmand, uh, Zabul, uh, a number of other provinces in the east and, and other locations. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's probably, it's not high levels for the Taliban. So I think in control of population and, and, and support, two of which are critical, both of which are critical for an insurgency, um, I think we, at, at the very least, see Afghan government doing better than the Taliban, but losing in both categories at least slightly. Um, final issue on the military front is sanctuary. And this, I think, where the situation does not look great for the uh, Afghan government, and that is uh, uh, insurgency, as you noted uh, in your opening remarks as well, has, continues to have sanctuary. It's leadership structure, it's three major regional shuras in Pakistan with some support from Iran, some from Russia, and a burgeoning drug trade that's been influential. What this suggests is the military conflict, I think, is likely to con continue for the foreseeable future with such support. Second, just briefly, um, uh, prospects for a peace settlement, uh, people may want them, but we should remember since 1945 there have been about 200 insurgencies, by my count, the last book I wrote, um, almost Three quarters of them have ended in a military victory by either the government or the insurgents. About a quarter have ended in a peace settlement. Uh, so we may want a settlement. Those odds are at quarter of, at best. And I think right now, I don't see the Taliban as assessing its situation as a draw. I think it believes it's winning, which means I think at least with the Taliban, I would say it's probably unlikely to settle, at least for the foreseeable future, assuming it continues to have sanctuary. Last point, um, just so we don't forget, I think when you look at Afghan society, without going into data, although I'm, I'm happy to, you know, the country does look like it's in reasonable shape. It's richer, it's healthier, and it's better educated, certainly, than it was in 2001. So despite the tough economic situation, Afghan society, GDP growth, uh, GDP per capita, uh, virtually all major health indicators, and then even education uh, indicators, uh, look on balance, certainly better over the last 17 years now. So a little bit of good, a little bit of bad. Uh, I think on the prospects of a settlement, I'm not particularly optimistic, though. Thanks. Courtney. Thanks, Marvin, uh, and thank you for having me today. Um, so just to take a step back to, to think about where we are. So in August of last year, the administration announces a new strategy on South Asia. 
This includes increased targeting of the Taliban. It includes an increased deployment of US military advisors. It includes a different approach towards Pakistan, a tougher approach towards Pakistan, um, effectively linking our success in Afghanistan to Pakistan's support of our strategy. Uh, so, so really, this was a very intensive military effort, primarily military um, approach towards stabilizing the stalemate. So we've invested a lot more in our partnership, and I think that that was really important step in order to stabilize that stalemate. Uh, but if you want to look at where we are nine months later, it's been exactly nine months, the Taliban and also international terrorist elements like ISIS continue to be able to stage attacks in the center of Kabul. Uh, we've seen a, a very strong start to fighting season. In fact, we didn't really see a winter lull like we did in years past with a number of very uh, uh, catastrophic high profile attacks in the center of Kabul and elsewhere around the country. Casualties are mounting. The UN estimates that the first quarter of this year was one of the um, uh, more dangerous for Afghan civilians. We had more than 10,000 Afghan civilian casualties last year. We have opium uh, po poppy cultivation rampant. I think a more than 50% increase in 2017 over 2016. This obviously has implications for governance. And I think realistically we're on the cusp of a potential major political upheaval with two elections scheduled over the next year. And we can all remember 2014 isn't that long ago, but 2014 um, essentially was a potential schism for the country. And there was a negotiated settlement to the presidential election, but I think we, um, I think we recognize the risks of, um, of orchestrating and, uh, and holding an election in a challenging security environment. So, um, lastly, on the regional front, as Javed mentioned, regional competition for and around Afghanistan appears to be on the rise, particularly as we have uh, taken a bit more competitive approach with several of Afghanistan's neighbors, Iran, Russia, China. Um, so the indicators don't look like we're moving towards uh, the potential for a military resolution, and I think Though many people are skeptical that a political settlement is possible, as Seth notes, just 25% uh, of insurgencies have ended in settlement, I, I think that there's a lot more that our community could be doing to ensure that this outcome ends favorably for our interests, for Afghan interests, for the region, and puts us in that 25% category instead of the 75% category. In terms of where we are specifically on the political settlement, uh, President Ghani did make a sweeping overture on the political process, and I think that that was an important step. Uh, at the same time, I'm not surprised that there wasn't a public Taliban overture accepting it, and I think we need to be realistic and make sure that we're vetting what the Taliban is seeking and demanding with, uh, with what is being offered. One of the, the, I mean, the primary thing that they publicly state a desire for is a withdrawal of international troops. Uh, I think you need to accept that in the Taliban frame of mind, the Taliban aren't publicly demanding to become a political party or amnesty for Taliban fighters. I would think that in their mind, just trying to put myself in their shoes, that, that, that is, that's akin to a surrender on unfavorable terms for the movement. What they want is to talk about foreign troops. That's something that the United States has purview over. Um, in their mind, the United States is who drove the Taliban from power in 2001. And, um, and so I think we need to recognize that the international community has a part in the conversation, what will be an inter-Afghan dialogue. But there is more that we could do uh, to be really trying to, to bring the Taliban to the table. I think both sides, the Taliban and the Afghan government, and including the United States really, um, at the senior level have all made overtures signaling an interest in dialogue. But I think there's just a question now of how to get all parties to move forward. Uh, just to respond briefly on the Taliban point, you know, the Taliban is less cohesive, it appears, than it ever has been, having gone through two major leadership transitions in the last few years. But at the same time, it's still an Afghan political organization. The, its counterpart, the Afghan polity in Kabul, is just as fractious, if not more, with also competing centers of power. So this creates challenges to getting to the table, but doesn't mean that we should lessen our efforts in any way to do so. I'll stop there. Yes, thank you, Courtney. Uh, I think we've gotten a good lay of the land here. And uh, in doing so, we've also touched on a good deal that we're, we're now going to be digging down with. And so I'm going to suggest six different scenarios here.
Again, we've touched on them, uh, but I think we can, we can go f a little further. Uh, but if we're going to get through all six, we'll also have to do it with rather brief uh, statements. So the first one, of course, is that a strengthened Afghan security forces, that Afghan security forces enabled by U.S. and the United States and its coalition partners here are able in time to overcome the insurgency. In other words, this is, this is a scenario that says that if we do the military part right, uh, whether it's an out route, uh, routing of the, the Taliban or probably more realistically driving them to the table, that uh, this, is, this is a conceivable outcome. So I ask you, how realistic is this? I think it's unlikely, Mervyn. Um, I think it's important to remember, well, actually, just not forget recent history. Uh, a major U.S. and international troop surge, upwards of 140,000 troops, was unable to produce this outcome you know, six years ago. Um, so absent uh, a more significant um, investment on the part of the international community, I, I, don't, I don't see how this is realistic. Um, so I, I don't see how 15,000 troops can accomplish this goal. So that's based on the assumption that we won't actually um, surpass those levels from before. I think w one of the only things that could actually change my calculus for this would be some of the other factors like the sanctuary piece. If sanctuary for Taliban senior leaders effectively ended completely, I think we would um, see potential, a different potential, a different military dynamic that might that might make this more likely, but as, as stated, I think it's relatively unlikely. So th this is a kind of skepticism, indeed, uh, in the August strategy. Uh, would, you, would you agree on that? Uh, because is, the, is not the August strategy based on, on this assumption? Certainly, well, our generals have well, suggested that. I do that. think we, we have to ask why we would be seeking a military victory. What's in it for U.S. national security interests to invest that kind of resources in, in Afghanistan right now. The Taliban have said that publicly they want to talk, they want a they want to find a way to end the conflict. They're not, I mean, they've also said that they would never allow um, international attacks to be staged from Afghan so soil. They're not an international threat to the United States or the homeland as they once were in many assessments. So they want to be part of the Afghan polity. Uh, I I don't know why we would necessarily be seeking a military victory if we don't have to go to that length. It seems like the ingredients are there for a political discussion, so uh, yeah. we should just resource that yeah. fully. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I certainly uh, agree with, with much of, um, of what, what Courtney said. I think if the objective, and I, I actually don't think, regardless of what's said in the strategy, I don't think most senior U.S. officials working on Afghanistan in, in the various uh, agencies from the intelligence community to the White House to the um, state and defense departments expect a military victory. Um, I think part of the objective is to um, put additional pressure on the Taliban in hopes of um, changing their cost-benefit calculation for either military force or settlement in the hopes that it raises the prospects for, uh, for a peace settlement. But I, I think if we're, you know we're in the we're in the vicinity of talking about fifteen thousand forces. I mean that's that is not sufficient by any uh, shape or manner to defeat an insurgency. I mean militarily defeat an insurgency uh, that has tens of thousands of fighters, not just in Afghanistan, but as all of us have noted here, has its leadership structure not even in the country, nor does it have its three major regional shuras in the country. They're in Pakistan. So as long as the military fight largely stays in Afghanistan, and as long as we're talking about really incremental increases, um, I, I, I just don't see this um, uh, uh, leading to a military defeat of the Taliban. I think what it does at best is a better capable, particularly army and high-end forces like the commandos, the Afghan National Army Special Forces, the Katehas, some of the high-end Afghan Ministry of Interior units, uh, they present a situation where the Taliban and other groups like uh, Islamic State are not able to overthrow the government, aren't able to hold urban terrain. So I ask, 
you know, is that good enough? Is that good enough uh, where the Afghan security forces can hold largely what they have, particularly the big populated areas for the foreseeable future, that's enough. If that's your goal and not defeat, then we may be able to talk about something. Yeah, just one quick point. Um, I mean, I, I, I agree with pretty much uh, everything Courtney said, but I disagree with the point that um, her, her argument that Taliban have asked for a uh, a political settlement. I, I, I doubt that they've asked for anything publicly. It neither have they signed a political deal yet. Um, do they want to be part of the Afghan polity? Uh, they have not made that clear yet either because their objective since 1996 have not changed, which is to change the Afghan political system or take over the Afghan political system and change it fundamentally. So that objective has not changed. Now, coming back to your question about the first scenario, look, Someone once rightly said that it's very hard to make predictions, especially if it's about the future, and that really, really applies to Afghanistan. Now, the Taliban uh, seems to be um, operating from a position of strength, but no uh, position is so strong that it's permanent. Now, I'm moderately confident that a strengthened um, Afghan security forces could, uh, if that's enabled by U.S. and its partners, could realistically change the conventional wisdom that military victory is possible. Uh, but it's not going to be an outright military victory. In other words, the, the stalemate is going to tilt uh, in, in favor of the Afghan forces. Now, that's going to force uh, or pressure the Taliban to come to a negotiating table. Now, two things need to happen that could enable the, the Afghan forces to overcome the insurgency in time. Now, uh, a, a, a more strengthened Afghan security forces uh, need to take back or have to take back the territory that the Taliban currently control or contest. Uh, that this will require boosting the Afghan offensive and defensive capabilities. The, on the offensive side, you need to boost the Afghan Air Force and the Afghan uh, Special Forces elements, which is the more um, uh, effective elements. Uh, and they're already working on it, boosting it from about 7, 17,000 Afghan soft elements right now to about 32, 34,000 uh, in the next uh, few years. On the defensive side, um, you need to uh, boost uh, the Afghan intelligence uh, capabilities uh, to, to be able to collect and analyze 360-degree intel collection. Um, and then essentially uh, able to uh, predict some of these uh, larger attacks that happen in major cities. Now, but until that happens, Afghan forces will remain dependent on, on, on their U.S. partners for close air support. Um, one, one challenge here is that the alarming rate in, uh, of casualties and attrition in, in Afghan security forces um, that in this has weakened the Afghan security forces more than anything else. And the reason behind that is that the Afghan forces are training and fighting simultaneously. You know, they train and then they're, uh, the, the, the next day or the next week, they're uh, in the battle be fighting. So where in the past, also the problem was that the focus in the training part was uh, too much uh, on the, uh, on focused on, uh, on the quantity of the force rather than the quality of the force. And that seems to be changing now as well. Uh, so, um, yeah, and, and this is gonna make the Afghan security forces more, more uh, effective. The second thing that need to happen is that if the pressure on Pakistan is sustained in increase, now it could yield measurable results because if you have a WASP problem, a B or WASP problem, you have to deal with the nest and the nest is essentially Pakistan. So on the Pakistan element too, there are important challenges that needs to be tackled. I mean, other than the initial messages that came out of uh, after the South Asia strategy announced last August, by uh, U.S. official directed towards uh, Pakistan, that sort of initial pressure has started to fade away as well. Now, the, the approach that the administration, or previous administration, U.S. administration, had taken towards Pakistan was largely tactical and reactive, where there was more and more focus uh, on the urgent and less and less focus on the important. Now, um, this needs to change with Washington beginning with the second phase of its, uh, its, its pressure on, uh, applied on Pakistan with one very, very important caveat, and that is to don't trust and verify. Okay. As a second scenario, one which we again have been already discussing, but what about a now 
a comprehensive reconciliation agreement. Uh, again, this has been our goal. Uh, but how realistic is it? Uh, does it have to be Afghan-led, for example? Uh, can we expect that those people who are the interlockers here really represent their own organization, as well as those other elements of the insurgency that are not at the table? And of course, we can also, as Seth points out, we also have to consider the fact that politically uh, the leadership in Afghanistan is anything but unified. So uh, briefly now, uh, after these several years of trying, although as Courtney points out, not always uh, with the kind of determination and, and uh, understanding of the process that we uh, would have liked, uh, right now, how realistic is a negotiated settlement? I'll start, if that's okay, Marvin, and just address something you just said. After several years of trying, I assume you mean to achieve a political settlement, yes, and yes. I would actually question that, we, okay. that we've, in fact, done that. When most people think about the surge, 2010, 2011, and I think we all know now that there were some uh, talks that have been acknowledged publicly taking place at the time, but you know, sending 140,000 international troops into Afghanistan to fight the Taliban is not the same as resourcing a, a dialogue effort with two people from across the interagency. Those are not equal. And so we haven't um, mobilized the whole of the international community and US departments and agencies to, to fully support a peace process. So that's the first thing. We haven't done it before. We could do it. We never have. Um, I think a comprehensive reconciliation agreement, a political settlement, I think it's plausible. And I think it's, at the, at the very core, it is more desirable than an endless military stalemate. And it is, and it is, it, you know, it, it certainly challenges, but it's more desirable than that. And it's more plausible than any kind of decisive military victory that, that we could achieve. Um, in terms of some of the follow-on questions you asked, does it have to be just Afghan-led? I, I certainly think the Afghan, intra-Afghan component is at its core, but there is absolutely an international dimension, and we have to recognize that we are part of that. We have troops in Afghanistan. Uh, we have for 17 years. We, we are a major component of that. And I think the Taliban recognize that. They know that it's U.S. troops that, that really are keeping them from coming back to Kabul. When they want... Uh, to be taken off UN sanctions list. It's the United States that could be a veto that could prevent that from happening. When they want to affect international troop numbers, they know it's the United States that has purview over that issue. So I think we need to recognize there is a greater international dimension as well. Um, in terms of how can we be sure that um, each party can deliver and represent uh, for, for all of the Taliban or the Afghan government, I think this to me places increased importance on CBMs, confidence building measures, that no peace process is going to happen overnight. It's going to take several years, and it's an incremental trust building process. Just like we have skepticism about the Taliban, although the Taliban very publicly has stated they, they have a diplomatic arm. It's based in Doha. Uh, and, and I assume that if there was a, an actual negotiation, the Taliban would put together a representative group of negotiators, just like the Afghan government would, and just like the United States would. Um, so I think that just because we don't see it now doesn't mean it's not there or, or wouldn't develop. Um, so I'll yeah. oh, it's, Seth, uh, I think we're, we're reading that there is no military solution as such. Uh, but that is, speaks for ourselves. Uh, is, it, is it clear that the Afghans at this point in time also believe? Uh, is it possible at least that the dominant leadership there still thinks that there is a military solution and that they can prevail if they simply wait us out. Well, I would say it a little differently, Marvin. I think the issue is not do Afghans believe that there is a military solution. I think the issue for actually for both sides, and really there are multiple sides, is what are the pros and cons of continuing versus a settlement at this point. And I think the challenge is when, 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 when people say there's no military solution, well, look, if there's not a political settlement and if neither of the sides can even agree to come together to discuss specifics, then the de facto other choice is they're going to fight on the battlefield. So 
it's not necessarily that they believe there's a military solution that will end it. It's, for the moment, the military, military actions are the least worst of the possible options that they face. And I think that's where we actually stand right now. And I, I would just say, you know, there have been efforts to reach out directly both on the track one and track two elements of, uh, of, of the Taliban. I've participated in some of those. I mean, I'll be honest, I have not seen the Taliban leadership. There clearly have been disagreements within the Taliban, but I have not seen the Taliban make a conscious, cohesive decision at this point that they believe that the best outcome for that organization is a settlement. I think there's still a lot of discussion. I would actually say, uh, if I'm reading them right, and you know, take this with a grain of salt, that they believe they can probably wait this one out. Uh, and that uh, they may be able to make military progress on the battlefield. So if a political solution is possible and they make military progress and keep fighting, at the very least, even if they don't win, they get a better terms for a deal if they come down the road. I think that's where we're at right now. And let me just highlight two or, two or three really quick things. We are not at a point where we got to, whether it was in Northern Ireland or in El Salvador or other cases where the peace settlement, where the insurgent side assesses that it cannot achieve its objectives by battlefield, uh, by continuing on the battlefield. Uh, the IRA was decimated in many ways by MI5 and British intelligence. It was not, it was not gonna get, it was not gonna reunite Ireland. And I just, I don't see the Taliban at that position right now, seeing that it does not have a military solution. So I, I don't think we're where we're at, where we've been at for a settlement with other, other, um, other uh, past insurgencies uh, that have led to a settlement. The last thing I'll just note is any settlement, as we, I think we all recognize, will get very complicated. It's at least a two-level game on both sides. There are going to be a range of Tajik, Uzbek, and Hazara uh, I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing a little too much, but um, uh, push back to any deal with the Taliban just because of the history of bloodshed. I mean, look at any of the northern cities like Mazar and Sharif and the bloodshed on multiple sides. Bringing a Taliban into the government is going to be resisted by elements just as much as we'll see it on the Taliban side. Elements of the Haqqani network, certainly groups like ISIS, will not accept any peace settlement. We'll see breakaway uh, factions and, and violence, uh, and we'll probably see Taliban defect uh, as part of a peace settlement and those that'll continue to want to fight. So even if we did have progress along those lines, you know, it, it'll be a complicated situation after that. Yeah, just two uh, quick points. I don't know if, uh, it, it, it is, it's really hard to actually uh, state whether the Afghans uh, a political class believe there's a military solution to the Afghan conflict because the Afghan political class is as divided on these issues as as as, uh, as political leaders here are in the U.S. So their position on the uh, on the military solution varies uh, where where they sit and who act, if, uh, if effectively uh, uh, bankrolls them. But I I see that there's a general consensus that yes, there's no military solution to to the conflict, but. Coming back to the scenario uh, question, I think this is obviously an ideal scenario if if uh, if the Taliban comes in um, and negotiate in good faith with the Afghan government. But that is only possible if they respond to President Ghani's peace proposal or, the, or their offer, which they haven't done yet. Now, from the Afghan perspective, this scenario has two elements, um, and it has to be approached from two different angles as well. Uh, the first is reaching some kind of a, a, a settlement uh, between Afghanistan and Pakistan. And then the, and then the second is um, uh, uh, a settlement with the Taliban. So in many ways, an Afghan-Pakistan state-to-state settlement would define uh, the terms for a settlement with the Taliban as well. Um, now, Ghani's, President Ghani's outreach to Pakistan was meant to find a way, and it continues to, uh, to, to find that way in order for Pakistan to see eye to eye uh, with, with, with Afghan leaders um, and then find some kind of a workable consensus. Now, Ghani has opened an unconditional diplomatic opportunity uh, to Pakistan. In other words, he has extended an olive basket to Pakistan, but uh, the, the only thing he has gotten so far is, is, is just spit. Uh, let me also say that um, 
every time there's been a, a military pressure applied on, on the Taliban, the, their leaders have come uh, out and have asked for, uh, for some kind of peace talks or negotiated settlement. Now, the Taliban, uh, as it stands right now, will never be in a stronger position than they are right now to negotiate peace, but only if they do it. Now, the, 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 the group uh, appears to be um, seeking a maximalist outcome uh, in any deal. Now, their demand is that, that they won't negotiate with the Afghan government, as Courtney mentioned, uh, and that they would, un until the U.S. force withdraw, or that they would only um, uh, negotiate with, with, with the United States, which is a key demand. But let me say that that's, that's quite unrealistic because uh, realistic in a pipe dream because the Taliban do not realize that the United States cannot unilaterally deliver a settlement uh, to them uh, in, in, in by itself. So, uh, but the United States could still work around this um, in, in meet the Taliban demand, for example, offering some kind of a conditional troop withdrawal timeline um, that, that's directly tied to specific benchmarks and action taken by the Taliban um, uh, with respect to the peace talks. So in other words, um, the Taliban will still need to make peace with some kind of a residual U.S. military force or a contingent, even if it's limited to an embassy level, to oversee and perhaps guarantee the full implementation of any peace deal. Um, and, and at the same time, there's a, a, a critical need for some kind of interlocutor, uh, perhaps the United Nations. Would Taliban agree to that arrangement as well? And the last point I wanted to make was, despite fraction within the insurgency, um, and I mentioned this earlier, the Taliban has no single pro-peace uh, pro, pro voice uh, or a messenger um, that could authoritatively deliver or speak on behalf of the, uh, the movement and deliver a, a, some kind of a, a settlement. And, and I'm talking about just one settlement on behalf of the entire movement. Um, uh, neither does the group have such a leader who could coalesce the entire movement around one single deal. Uh, the reconciliation also does not come as, a, uh, as an ideal option to many Taliban leaders, not, not just because they, they hate or despise the Afghan constitution, but because they sometimes see it as a shame to reconcile with the Afghan government, or because uh, they, they, they don't like to be disarmed. Um, so, uh, so, so how do you uh, reconcile that as well? And one last, last point is that I think there will ultimately be multiple deals, not a single deal. Uh, and it's, but it still has to come down to the Taliban to come to the negotiating table and accept Ghani's offer if they're serious about talks. Uh, the medium-term challenge here would be the, pir the prioritization of those peace terms, the sequencing it, and then the timing. Uh, you've really uh, given us a segue into the third scenario, which does not envision that there will be a grand bargain does not envision that at some time in the future, whether it's in Geneva or anywhere else, they will sit around the table and be able to hammer out, uh, albeit it would take, well, I think we agree it would take not weeks or months, but conceivably even years to do so, during which, of course, a great deal is still going on on the ground. Uh, so I, Javid already has suggested that perhaps a third scenario here doesn't envision that at all, but still sees a political settlement, settlement coming about as a result of conditions, which I would like you to consider, conditions in which you could degrade the Taliban, in which the Taliban could, individual Taliban commanders and their fighters could decide to strike separate deals uh, so how realistic is that? Under what conditions could one expect that to occur? I mean, I, I'll, I can jump in just for a second. I think, uh, I mean, I think it's certainly the case that, and we've seen it, you know, the, the territorial control has changed a lot over the past 17 years. Certainly see it as possible for various Afghan military commanders, shadow governors in provinces or districts that lose territory to be willing to uh, cut a deal and join the government. I mean, we've seen that 
from uh, day one in, in 2001, you know, Rice Bagrani, for example, uh, defected from the Taliban, as have did several senior leaders, even at that point when the regime was overthrown uh, in Afghanistan. So if we look at kind of a micro level, certainly possible to see various elements. But I don't see that as ending uh, the war in and of itself. It may trigger reconciliation in very specific areas. The one way that three might happen would be, or, or at least one way that three might happen would be, and I think it's something that both Courtney and Javed have alluded to earlier, is if we were to see uh, a strong push from Pakistan in particular for uh, the Taliban leadership to cut a deal, or they were kicked out of the country, meaning uh, they no longer had sanctuary and they were forced to go into Afghanistan. Um, as, but as long as I think they've got sanctuary and they do have some support, I think it's going to be hard to see a political solution along the lines of number three. Uh, you know, micro level reconciliation certainly, and we've already seen that in various phases. But uh, unless something were to happen on the Pakistan side, I'd be skeptical with three. That's at least that's the way I think it, one way it would happen. Gordon, uh, sure. Uh, I think this scenario is less likely than others, or at least than than the previous one. So the Taliban have proven itself to be at least as cohesive as the Afghan polity. Uh, and there's very little evidence that we have that outside actors, whether it be Afghan government actors or international community, can effectively exploit any kind of fissures within the movement to the point that it would have a very strategic impact. I think the best chance for this would have been immediately following the death of Mullah Omar. Um, and we talked about it. I was at the White House at the time. And it, it, it's. It, there's a there's an access issue, there's a visibility issue, and it's and it's a very closed organization. So to be able to think that we could help affect this, I think, is a little optimistic. I think it's also important to remember that, as Chavid mentioned, the Taliban has been around 24 years. The group is extremely good at resolving grievances within the movement and uh, restoring cohesiveness mm -hmm. if there are any disagreements within the movement. So um, to think that you could piecemeal pull off. Uh, different groups, uh, not to say it's not worth trying, but this, this effort, reintegration, has been infinitely resourced in the past and has not proven to be effective because of difficulty in ensuring that, um, that any commanders who give up arms, whatnot, don't go back to the fight. Um, and, and I think the other issue that you would need to see, the other condition would be a very um, effective and accountable Afghan High Peace Council, if that is to be the body that, that orchestrates this movement, I think you would also have to see um, a much more cohesive Afghan polity. So you would need to come through the next two elections with a much more empowered um, uh, Afghan government that has the full support of different elements. Yeah, so so what, what you're saying, and I think that this is important, is that we would have to envision an Afghan government which, in effect, was attractive mm -hmm. and created the incentives for these individual groups to break off. And uh, the only thing you could argue is that what we're there for then, if you take this scenario, is to buy them time to get to that point. Although that does ignore the Taliban's religious justification for recruitment and for jihad also. If you don't actually change the calculus of the status of international troops, I, I think that will be harder okay. to do. Okay. I think in the medium term, this is perhaps the best possible scenario where um, th that, that could potentially unfold, that could potentially have more success than one where we wait and see if we can reach a single deal with the Taliban. Um, I, I call degrading uh, the insurgency in a process of these piecemeal agreements um, salami slicing approach. And, and by salami slicing approach, what I mean is um, peeling off these uh, Taliban splintered or offshoot uh, groups and then gradually integrating them into the Afghan government. Now, for this to happen, oh, I, I completely agree is, uh, with Marvin, is that the Afghan government would need to incentivize this one way or the other uh, by offering perhaps um, uh, um, some kind of an immunity, uh, protective zones uh, with security guarantees, 
financial guarantees as well, employment, uh, among other things. Um, so deals that would basically uh, mirror one that was reached between the Afghan government and the Hezb Islami Hekmatyar group. Um, and I, but as I mentioned earlier, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's difficult to reach a single deal, but it's much easier to forge these multiple deals at a local level. In the past, Afghan forces and Afghan authorities at the provincial level, uh, they've made such deals with the Taliban for defensive and tactical purposes. Uh, some to forestall attacks, other to get even military supplies to their uh, forces, Afghan forces in remote areas. Now, none of these deals that have been reached uh, were perfect. They, they were not perfect for the Afghan government and they were not perfect uh, for, for the Taliban either. Uh, but so, but they, they've, they engaged in this alliances of convenience, uh, uh, sorry, alliances of necessity rather than convenience. But in order to make the conditions suitable for this scenario, uh, the Afghan US government would need to pursue a more sort of coordinated uh, uh, political and then military strategy uh, where they would have an open door policy for all Taliban uh, leaders and their uh, fighters to come to in and engage uh, in talks. But they would also not abandon, the US and Afghans would also not abandon their military efforts against the irreconcilable elements uh, within, uh, uh, within Afghanistan. Now finally, I would imagine that uh, those Taliban elements who reconcile with the Afghan government through s some of these piecemeal smaller deals would have to agree at least in principle to some kind of uh, a DDR process, so the, the, the uh, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. With, uh, and I would add one additional D, D to it, and that would be for de-radicalization. Yeah, I would, I would probably, you probably agree that we would have to envision, for example, an improved economy which was able to create the incentives because uh, you would be, the potential of jobs, uh, whether it's building a pipeline or whatever, because in fact one of the, one of the groups did suggest they would be prepared if they could get jobs building the pipeline. Uh, the, fourth, the fourth scenario, I don't know whether it warrants necessarily discussion because, but I think we ought to take it certainly into consideration, that is simply, as we look ahead here, that the conflict continues inconclusively, indefinitely, with neither side capable of achieving a decisive victory. Uh, I don't think we can dismiss this. Now you can say, well, nothing goes on forever. But uh, uh, a few years is a long, you know, can be a long time. Uh, so I, I don't know, do you want to say anything? Uh, is there any, to what extent uh, can we uh, prepare ourselves? Uh, really, it's more ours, our, our problem in a way. Uh, can, can we keep the American public engaged in a war which seems to have no conclusion? After all, it's supposedly condition-based. Well, if the condition is that nothing seems possible here, uh, then I don't know whether the Congress or the American public, regardless of what the administration's position is, is going to enable us to sustain any, any thought. Yeah, just, I mean, just three quick comments. One is, I think this is the most likely, uh, at least short term, short to midterm um, of the six options. Not the best by any means, uh, but I think it's the most likely one for a number of reasons that people have laid out. Um, I think th I was in the UK last week, as you probably heard, the British are, are expected uh, shortly to announce uh, an additional 400 forces for Afghanistan. It's not a lot, but it does show that some of the US's NATO allies are willing to continue to commit forces there. I think as long as the US casualties are relatively low, which they are right now, um, uh, that, that the US will probably be willing uh, to continue. And then the third issue, which is sort of US interests, I think as long as, uh, and this is part of U.S. intelligence community judgment, as long as the judgment is that um, uh, U.S. departure or broader NATO departure mm -hmm. would lead to a probably an increase in terrorist activity, including transnational groups like the Islamic State and Al Qaeda, I think it'd be even even this scenario. It's going to be hard pressed to walk away if that's what you're leaving the country. And then even on the human rights end, if you end up with a Taliban regime that is much more oppressive to women, 
going to be hard to leave that legacy as well. So I think, I think for the moment, any U.S. government that doesn't face a lot of casualties with forces on the ground and is facing prospects of leaving terrorist groups operating in the country and uh, human rights abuses if the Taliban were to come to power, I think will probably be enough to keep this, uh, keep at least the U.S. Um, in the Afghan mix for the foreseeable future. Okay, quickly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just, just two quick points. I think one is uh, there's an important difference between how the United States uh, and the Taliban perceive, interpret, or even define winning in Afghanistan in general. Uh, the, the, the United States believe if it's not uh, winning in Afghanistan, it's losing it. The Taliban believe if it's not losing it, it's effectively uh, winning the, 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 the war. Now, I, I live here in Washington. I, I, I read. I, uh, I watch uh, the public debates. I, I see this overwrought pessimism in American public debate policy uh, community as well, but the Afghan war um, in, in among Americans as well. Um, about the Afghan war. Now, the Taliban are also closely monitoring these developments. And, uh, and they're engaged to, to a large extent, actually, if you, if you are on Twitter, you will see it um, uh, in these public debates directly as well. Um, their objective is pretty clear. They realize that they cannot defeat the United States in Afghanistan, but, but they're trying to defeat uh, them inside the United States by punching a hole in American public perception of the Afghan war uh, uh, inside the U.S. and then using that essentially as a weapon, as a tool to force the United States to extricate itself uh, from Afghanistan, and I would say prematurely. Now, look, at the height of the Afghan war, and I'm talking about as early as 2012 or 2013, the United States operated about 715 military bases. Now, that's has come down to about 12 to 15 bases right now uh, in Afghanistan. There were roughly 75,000 U.S. troops uh, a few years ago in Afghanistan. That number is now down to about 10 to 12,000 troops. They're engaged in two complementary missions, uh, train, advise, and assist the Afghan security forces in a counterterrorism mission uh, against a variety of terrorist uh, groups. They're not Afghan terrorist groups. They're transnational terrorist groups. Now. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you don't need in Afghanistan so we could check it off the list. Uh, uh, and so we could bring down the overall troop numbers. Do you not need the uh, uh, US intelligence assets on the ground so they could watch over Iran, China, Pakistan, nukes, uh, terrorist groups? Uh, do you uh, not need the US uh, special operations capabilities to be present in the region? Uh, do you uh, not need quick medevac or medical evacuation capabilities on the ground? Do you not need an embassy? Um, does, it, does the United States not need an important ally in the form of Afghan forces? So all of these require some kind of a military presence. So if Afghan forces and Americans do not fight the Taliban, the Taliban actually want to fight the, the Afghan forces in, in the Americans, so they're not going to stop. So on any given day today, they're about 25 to 30 Afghan forces and civilians that are killed in Afghanistan. Now, in this the last point, unfortunately, we have to uh, uh, realize and understand one very important strategic paradox of Afghanistan, is, in, in meaning that the more the United States um, uh, pushes to leave Afghanistan, the more it creates the condition for it to stay, and I, and I think we have to change that perception. Sure, just very briefly. I agree with Seth that, unfortunately, this, this scenario seems plausible, uh, if not likely. And I think even more so, if we continue to hold on to what currently amounts to a fight-then-talk strategy, uh, realistically, in any negotiation, not all sides can come to the table from a position of strength. And if you wait for, if we wait to see what we think is in a position of strength, the Taliban might view as not an opportune time for them to talk. You're going to, you can't get all parties at the table at the same time if they're all adhering to this rule. Uh, a colleague of mine who's a renowned scholar on Afghanistan uh, has provided several times this anecdote, it's one of my favorites, that in one of his conversations with a former very senior Taliban leader, he asked him, so what made you decide to come to talks? What, what makes the group more willing to come to talks? Uh, this was in 2010, 2009 timeframe. And the answer from the senior Taliban leader was, well, we felt strong enough to talk. 
And so I think what's more important than any specific sequencing is actually just a political pathway for all groups to achieve some portion of what their ultimate goal and outcome is. So absent, absent that, if we want to continue sequencing this or refusing to talk or uh, wanting to, you know, wanting to negotiate or waiting to negotiate until the Afghan government has 80% territorial control or, or whatever that anecdote is, I think we could be waiting a very long time. Uh, we perhaps also ought to consider whether, regardless of what's happening, the United States decides that it is in its security interest to stay in Afghanistan. Given developments with Iran, China, the region in general, our concern here about proliferation and conflict in South Asia generally, uh, perhaps you could make the argument that, yes, we can, we can stay there and, and let this go on. And we've heard criticism of this because we have other larger strategic interests so uh, we don't like to go there because it puts our interests ahead of what we all want to see, and that is peace in Afghanistan. But uh, I don't think we can dismiss that. We've got two more scenarios, and we've got very little time. But the fifth scenario simply envisions that the Taliban do wait us out, and it is the government which fails. That is that uh, there is civil conflict within the government, uh, that it implodes, if you will, uh, that it begins fighting with itself, and that what we have to look here is a, a process where the foreign forces decide, hey, wait a second, this is no place for us to be around. We saw this in Vietnam, and at that point, uh, the Taliban effectively are able to uh, restore their emirate. Uh, now, should we take that seriously? I think that's not out of the question. I mean, we've, we've seen a variant of that in the 1990s. The PDPA government collapsed in Afghanistan after not just the departure of Soviet forces, but also the departure of assistance for the most part. So if we were, for political reasons, to see a departure of international forces um, I think this scenario, and again, this is not just the Taliban per se, this is Taliban plus backers, including state backers. I think that's an outcome that is, I think, plausible. How likely it is, it would depend, but I think it's plausible. I also think the other alternative to this is a collapse of the national unity government, which is not a zero probability uh, outcome. There have been a lot of internal fissures within the national unity government, including between Ashraf Ghani and Abdullah, since it was formed, and obviously even before then, uh, during the elections and before the elections. And if you look at the disagreements between everything from Ghani to Muhammad Atta Noor, we see various fissures within uh, the center and the provincial leadership and district leadership and among parties like Jamiat. So I think, I think this, this would be the other way for five and even a variant of six to happen is, is if there's some kind of, of a collapse of the national unity government. It may, it may not be a high, prior, a high probability, but it's, it's not a zero probability. Especially given the election so that we have coming up. Uh, yeah. Thoughts? I mean, I agree with Seth on, on this one. Uh, this, this scenario is only possible um, in, in if, if the United States withdraws from Afghanistan prematurely uh, it, before any kind of settlement uh, with the Taliban is reached. Now, if that happens, I, I, I would argue that it, it won't be the Taliban who would um, overthrow or overwhelm the Afghan uh, forces in the Afghan government, but their foreign backers, primarily Pakistan. And I say this because the Taliban in recent months and years have become much closer to the Pakistani security services, um, and they've increasingly become less and less about Islam um, and more and more about Islamabad. So let me also say that, uh, um, uh, that the Taliban is not a secessionist uh, uh, movement. Um, it's, it's an externally enabled proxy. Now, how are, if, if they take over uh, in, in have their Islamic emirate back, how are they going to govern? Um, 
they're not ideologically predisposed to, to, to govern um, uh, the areas in the population uh, that, to, which they control or contest even at the moment. Uh, they are and were instructed by their sponsors essentially uh, to do so over the years. So, and so they engage in these uh, managing local governance largely to create some kind of a political legitimacy uh, for itself and for the movement. Now, the Taliban cannot claim that they have a um, uh, common ideological um, uh, norms or beliefs uh, or norms of reciprocity that they share with local Afghans. The Taliban actually used terror um, to stoke fear and in, in largely to ensure political compliance. That's not controlling the population, that's, that's intimidation. That's, the, so the problem with using fear as a tactic is that it could suppress um, uh, the, the, the opposition uh, at the local level, but it cannot buy you loyalty. Um, the last point I want to make was that in the event the Taliban do come back and establish, reestablish itself, the onus would here would unfortunately fall on the shoulders of the United States. Uh, the memories of 9-11 are still fresh in people's mind. Uh, so, you know, assume the Taliban again provides some kind of sanctuary and support to, you know, another terrorist group, um, and they plan and plot an event that targets the U.S., or maybe not mainland, but U.S. assets somewhere in the region or U.S. ally or uh, it would necessitate some kind of a reintervention in Afghanistan. And if that happens, that reintervention is going to be on much harder grounds. Uh, also, needless to say this, but if this scenario becomes a reality, the last uh, uh, 17 years of progress would be wasted. Just, uh, just a quick comment on that. I think it's important to note, though, that the Taliban of 2018 is not necessarily the Taliban of 2000. And I think there have been lots of examples and reasons to reasons to assess that the Taliban understands what it lost in 2001 based on its harboring of al-Qaeda. So I don't think it's necessarily a fair assumption that Taliban coming into government automatically means safe haven for international terrorist groups. I think that's something that's a, I think an empty data point that's used by people who are skeptical of moving forward with the peace process. And in fact, the Taliban have um, uh, have demonstrated um, a capability to fight Islamic State fighters. We've seen that a lot over the last two years, lots of examples of fighting between ISIS and Taliban. And so I think there's a way to bound any Taliban participation in a future government that ensures um, th this issue is addressed or our concern about safe haven for terrorist groups. So that's one quick point there. Um, I think, like Seth, I think this outcome where the Islamic Emirate is restored is highly unlikely, absent a complete cessation of international aid and you know, hasty withdrawal of international troops. I think it's more likely, as Seth also noted, um, to, to, to evolve following a collapsed government or some kind of protracted civil war between Afghan groups, which I know is uh, scenario 16. So I think five could follow six. Six, yes, yes. but um, otherwise it's unlikely. Right. Well, this question about whether this is the same Taliban as your father's Taliban uh, is very relevant for the sixth, which envisions a bloody, protracted civil war. And that's premised on the idea that there is, unlike the 90s, when the, as the Taliban came in, the government, such as it was, ran away. The various warlords ran away. Uh, it may very well be that no force can control Afghanistan at this point, uh, and that you would have a with a, you'd have a collapsed government. You'd have a, a, a foreign forces, foreign presence here, which uh, effectively wipes its hands, uh, and that you have uh, not simply the replacement of one government by another government but rather a open-ended conflict. Uh, not, a pleasant, not a pleasant scenario, certainly, but how realistic? Courtney? It's plausible. And, Plaus and I think uh, a very chaotic and divisive um, election season is something that could precipitate this in, in, a, in more of the media term.
just to briefly add what I think is, I mean, I think a version of this, uh, at least in the sense that I'll lay out, already is happening. I mean, the great game is alive and well in Afghanistan. Uh, I could certainly see a scenario if there were a collapsed government, which six gets to, where we get Indian backing, I mean, there already is Indian backing to sub-state and state elements, Pakistan backing to state and sub-state elements, Iranian backing to state and sub-state elements, Russian backing, Chinese backing, not to mention U.S. or European or Central Asian. I mean, I, I, I think Afghanistan has historically been a country where regional and in some cases global powers have provided assistance to proxy organizations. I mean, the Indian-Pakistan uh, proxy war is just one example of that. I mean, I think there would certainly be uh, uh, scenarios that would be possible along these lines that there's a bigger Lashkar-e Taiba presence in Afghanistan. India is definitely going to have a range of interest to um, make sure that that does not uh, decrease the security of India, uh, for example. So I, I think there are a range of scenarios um, where something like this, particularly with outside powers providing assistance to state and sub-state elements is certainly possible. And I would just say it's going on at various levels uh, today, but with a slightly stronger government than your scenario six okay. highlights. I'd like to move to questions, but, but Javid. Yeah, absolutely. Just like very, very briefly. If you want to define a nightmare scenario, uh, that, so this would essentially be a collapsed government in Afghanistan with no foreign troops to, to back it, uh, with, the, it's, with the economy completely in shambles, uh, and one that's aggravated by uh, a regional proxy-led intervention and then a brutal civil war. This would be uh, essentially a serious scenario, except it's going to be much worse. Um, so yes, the balkanization of Afghanistan, uh, where the country would essentially split across factional and ethnic lines, uh, is highly likely, if not certain. And if one can anticipate what happens at the end of the process, uh, I think we have to seriously consider here that the country is split, mm. that the end result here is somewhere down the road, uh, since we'll assume that civil wars can't go on forever, that in effect uh, Afghanistan as we know it may look, uh, look very different in that future scenario. Questions, please identify yourself. We don't have that much time, so please keep it short. This gentleman down here, Front, do we have a microphone? Uh, yeah, please, it's coming. Uh, okay, I'll try to, but please, uh, quick, right here, the, the, this gentleman right here in front. Yeah, Dan Lieberman. Yeah, we talked a lot about the different actors on the Afghan landscape. We haven't talked about the Afghan people. Is there an Afghan people? And do they have any say in what will happen? And let's take a couple more questions so that we're sure to get them. Okay, over here, and then back there. My name is Max Gross. Uh, I'd like to ask the panelists uh, to discuss the recent reconciliation between the Ghani, the Ghani government and Hikmet Yar and any implications that may or may not have on the general discussion we're having today. Okay, and this gentleman right here. My name is Tareen. Oh, please, if you wait for. My name is Tareen, and I'm going to ask you a question which slightly is out of the box. Uh, have you considered a partition of Afghanistan where the Pashtun dominated areas become the buffer state between Afghanistan and Pakistan? Okay, okay. very good. Uh, panel. Uh, I'll start with the second question on the Hezbi Islami deal. Uh, I was at the White House during the, much of the time of the negotiations and when the, the deal was finalized. I think it was a really important step for the Afghan government to demonstrate its ability to not only negotiate this agreement but build unity within, uh, within the Afghan polity to, to see to its fruition. Obviously, Hekmatyar is not a beloved character in Afghanistan and, and uh, it was probably very difficult to build that kind of support and, and they accomplished that. That said, um, not doing so, I think, could have provided great disincentive for the Taliban. Uh, 
That said, I, I don't think that the way the Afghan government would engage the Taliban is necessarily the same as has been Islami. It's important to remember that Hig was a spent political force. Uh, Hekmatyar was in hiding. It right, hadn't right. successfully launched any attacks in, uh, in quite some time. Far fewer fighters than we see in the Taliban. So I think, uh, I think we need to be a little bit more creative than expecting a, a Taliban negotiation uh, will necessarily follow the same model. I think there's important elements there and help create some of the muscle memory, but I think it's, it's going to be a, a, lot, uh, a lot greater in scale. And Hezbi Islami always wanted to be part of the political system. It, it just wanted to dominate it. It was never a question about whether you wanted to join that kind of political system. Uh, other questions, responses? Yeah. Yeah, just briefly on, on, on the question of um, the Afghan people. Yes, it, it, it seems like there is a, a more generic general consensus among the Afghan diaspora on what they want and how they see uh, the future of uh, Afghanistan to uh, unfold. There's also a, a more general consensus um, uh, in Afghanistan among the Afghan political class as well that peace with the Taliban, for example, is ultimately the solution. Now, are there spoilers? Yes, of course. Um, uh, it, but, but those are minority voices, and those are people largely, I would say, in the Afghan political class who relishes chaos, uh, who sees destruction as power, and these do so largely because they, their own personal interests are at stake. So they do, they do not want uh, the Taliban to come in and then so they could share this, uh, their sort of um, uh, lucrative uh, Afghan patronage pie with them. So, so in that case, uh, um, uh, that, 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 that is a problem. But again, as I mentioned, it's a minority group that could easily be dealt with. Uh, either they could be incentivized or brought in, um, if, uh, especially those who are not brought in yet, uh, or they could be marginalized. On the Hizb Islami one, um, look, the, the major difference between Hizb Islam and the Taliban is the Taliban may have a leader, a spiritual leader, but the, um, it's still a very incohesive, decentralized group. Hizb Islami was different than that. It, it had one leader who commanded greater legitimacy. Uh, so he, he was brought in. You know, I agree with Courtney that Hizb Islami Matar was a spent force, so they had to, uh, they had to come in and negotiate. Now, for in one, one thing that could potentially sort of serve, the, his, the Hizb Islami Hikmatyar uh, deal with the Afghan government is not a model to follow uh, with, with respect to uh, any deal that could be reached with the Taliban. Um, because, uh, again, they, 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 do, they, they, they had Hikmatyar, but the uh, Taliban group do not have such a leader who could coalesce the entire movement around one single deal. Um, so in this case, that's a major difference. But uh, uh, we also have not seen. I mean, Hekmatyar has been incredibly uh, proactive these days. He's been engaged. Uh, you know, he's in the media all the time. We haven't seen any uh, Taliban leader do so. So, uh, if one thing Taliban could learn from his Islami Hekmatyar, it, it would be that. Just briefly, uh, starting with the last question. I mean, on the partition one. Um, I mean, there's so little agreement on. Durand Line, there have been probably more than people recognize uh, border disputes on the ground between Afghan and Pakistan forces that the U.S. has gotten, gotten pulled into in one, one way or the other. The idea that there would be any political stomach for any kind of partition, I think, whatsoever is a, a, probably a political non-starter. And on the Hezbo Islami issue, just to reinforce one comment um, that I think Javed made, you know, one element that allowed for that agreement was uh, the considerable weakening of Hezbo Islami on the ground as a force. I mean, I was involved in several, directly involved in several efforts to reintegrate um, Hezbo Islami forces on the ground because they've been battered. Uh, so part of the decision, I think, was they were in a pretty tough spot um, leading up to the, the deal. And also, interestingly, you know, people may not have noticed, I, uh, how well integrated they already were, or at least some elements in the palace, well before the uh, deal even happened. I mean, I came across many Hezb Islami members in the palace well before Hekmatyar uh, reached that agreement. So that that had the the roots for that had had been years in the making, including their slow integration into the political process, including in the palace itself in Kabul. So that would be hard to replicate. Uh, I think for for the for for the reasons that um, that both Courtney and Javed mentioned. 
Uh, and we'll take three more questions. Yes, there is an Afghan people. I think that most observers here would say that. They are a nation. They've always wanted to be a nation. They want to belong anywhere else. But they've not been a state. They've never managed to be at least the kind of, yes, they have been a state, but not the kind of state that we generally are accustomed to where you've got a central government that is able to uh, have a complete writ across the country. Let's take uh, uh, here, here, and there. OK, we've got three people right here. Thank you, Robin Rafel. Just following up on the point about the Afghan people, I wonder if the panel could comment on these recent uh, peace movements, peace demonstrations, and uh, what they imply for our discussion this afternoon. Hi, Cheryl Garner. Given the uh, crisis that you had with the last presidential election, what's the incentive for the Taliban to enter into any kind of peace negotiation when they can just kind of sit back and see what's going to happen in 2019? In 2018. 2019 for presidential. presidential after, the, after the presidential. Uh, this is a question that, that also relates to the Afghan people. You haven't mentioned corruption. Uh, my understanding was that that was a real problem in, in, in developing support for the government, particularly the local police. Okay, panel. Uh, to Cheryl's question, uh, I think you're exactly right. I think the looming political events and two elections probably provide um, an incentive to wait it out and see what happens after that next election. I think best case scenario is we have a very kind of consolidated uh, Afghan polity following the presidential election, a clear decisive victory, and an empowered leader uh, who can move forward in earnest with talks that would make a, a strong negotiating partner for the Taliban um, within the Afghan government. But I think there's a lot of uncertainty, which is why I'm skeptical that, I, I think we see a lot of the elements, like the Helmand peace process, I, or peace marches, um, some of the elements uh, are, are starting to develop to suggest that, that we're moving closer towards conditions for political settlement, but there is still um, incentive to wait it out. And others? I mean, I'll just touch on the corruption one. Um, just, just to, I, I, I was looking actually before the um, uh, panel today on the, both the Transparency International and the World Bank Governance Indicators corruption data. Uh, the, the, if you look at those two metrics as indicators, the country has not progressed uh, from an anti-corruption level. I mean, there certainly have been, and the, the World Bank has demonstrated, um, you know, has highlighted some positive developments, including under the Ghani government in some areas. But I think across the board, corruption uh, is still a notable problem at multiple levels. And I'm talking about something more than just how you get things done. Uh, in the country, but much more serious extortion, bribery at strategic levels, um, including participation in the drug trade, and, and all sides participate in the drug trade. And, and I think that's why, the, in my view, this goes back to a range of the scenarios. This is why my prospect for an Afghan win aren't that high on, on the battlefield, because I just don't see, when you look at some of the polling data, including some of the work that the Asia Foundation has done, there's been still high levels of criticism at the government for its general competence. Um, and corruption remains a very significant concern among the Afga Afghans directed at their government. It's, it's a concern that people direct at the Taliban as well, because it's heavily involved in the drug trade. But I think corruption uh, the, and, and the challenges on both sides um, are put us in a situation where we will probably see this continue in the direction it's going for the moment um, with neither side winning because no one is a beacon of, of uh, legitimacy at the moment. Last word? Yes. Um, just on, on the question of uh, the peace movement, yes, there are, there are peace movements in Afghanistan, you know, uh, uh, albeit uh, very sort of sporadically. Uh, in, in pockets of the country. In Helmand, for example, there's a, there's a movement, uh, there's a peace rally that started from Helmand in, uh, uh, in, in southern Afghanistan. And 
start to move towards Kabul and they're, and they're on the way and it's also during Ramadan. So yes, there, there, there have been those peace movements in the country plus uh, the Afghan government have had um, high level conferences in Uzbekistan and Kabul and Indonesia as well to sort of build on some of those. Uh, there has been overwhelming support among Afghans for those peace movements. Um, it has, if you ask me whether uh, these movements have yielded any results, no. Uh, I would say we haven't seen any, anything measurable or tangible yet. Uh, Taliban's response to these movements has been just uh, simple rejection. On, on the question of elections, I, I agree, Cheryl, with you uh, on the election part because it's a very important national process. I think Afghan leaders need to get their act together, uh, especially when it comes to the elections, uh, and then at least stick to their end of the bargain when they say that, uh, um, that uh, or uh, when, when they argue that elections need to happen, um, so they need to happen and they need to happen on time. Um, it, it would also send a very sort of unified message to the Taliban as well, but the Taliban on the other hand are also on an increased sort of uh, um, assertive, uh, uh, they've sort of adopted very assertive uh, method to disrupt uh, those Dasha processes. Now, whether or not the election is going to be held remains to be seen, but, um, the, but the presidential election, should it not happen, could potentially create a mini crisis similar to one in 20, um, yeah. You know, on these popular movements, it strikes me as, as unexpected that the Taliban haven't tried to co-opt them. Here you have a calling out, basically, for, for relief from the conflict. And it seems to me that this would have provided an opportunity for the Taliban uh, to, to effect, take ownership uh, of this. Uh, but uh, it, it's not in their playbook. Uh, well, we have reached the end of our, our session, and uh, I hope what we have done here is to cover ground that uh, we have not, in our general discussions of Afghanistan, uh, been willing to, to examine. So, uh, again, I, I thank you for, for coming, and let's thank our, our wonderful panel.